Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's been a month since Comet 3i Atlas was discovered screaming through our solar system at speeds unheard of. In the last month, we found out a few more things about it, and we've also had some few, a uh, few interesting papers written about it, including usual suspect Avi Loeb saying, "Hey, it could well be alien technology." And of course, one scientist's attention-grabbing statement about the potential of it being alien technology has been taken by, well, the usual news sources to say, many scientists think it could be alien technology. And of course, uh, I don't see any evidence of this, but I don't see any evidence against it. Uh, I think it's just a rock flying through space. And my main counter-argument to this paper is that what they do is they basically list a whole bunch of factors which say, hey, this is a, like a really low probability of this ha thing happening, right? They've measured like nine different things that are low probability. What are the odds of that? Well, take a look at their list of planets that it comes close to. They say it comes close to Venus, Mars, and Jupiter, and the probability of each of these is a few percent. They multiply them together and they get a v probability of 0.005%. Well, first of all, these probabilities are not independent. If you're coming close to Venus, there's a pretty good chance that you're coming close to Mars. So you can't simply multiply these probabilities. That doesn't make sense. The other thing is they've picked three planets out of nine. Well, if you look at combinations, uh, three planets out of nine, there's 84 different combinations. So even if this was a one in a hundred percent chance, which it isn't, uh, there would still be 86 other random possibilities which weren't bad. So the point is that by picking the right combination, you can make something seem exceptional when in fact it's just mundane and background noise. Another statement I saw that, uh, you know, I questioned was, it is difficult to imagine a natural process that would favor a plunge at over 60 kilometers per second. Oh my god! There are actually lots of stars near us which have velocities relative to the sun of greater than 60 kilometers per second. That's very easy to imagine a comet moving at that speed. But look, fair's fair. If this thing does start slowing down and spitting out little green men, I will absolutely apologize publicly. Anyway, in the last month, observations have continued. We still haven't really got a good size on the object because we haven't managed to pin down just how much of the brightness is coming from a potential off-gassing or coma. I saw a number of posts asking about what would happen if this hit the Earth. And, uh, you know, if you just take the idea that it's an asteroid with no clouds around it, then you get an object that's about 10 kilometers across. And something moving at these ridiculous speeds would absolutely be an impact bigger than what wiped out the dinosaurs. But because we still haven't been able to separate the coma from the nucleus, we can't really be sure 10, 11 kilometers is really an upper limit on the size of this object. And it could merely be global catastrophe rather than global extinction if it actually came near enough the Earth to hit us. But it does make us think, you know, while we're getting to the point where we've solved the problems with the near-Earth asteroids and periodic orb orbits, there's a non-zero chance that something could come from out of nowhere and smack into the Earth and do some serious damage. But... Yeah, one thing at a time. On the less speculative side, one observation that came out, which surprised exactly no one, was that the Vera Rubin Observatory had actually observed it during its commissioning phase uh, before the actual discovery date. And actually, this is pretty important because it shows that Vera Rubin will actually help us find these objects going forwards and perhaps give us more of a lead time to think about what we're going to do with them. For example, in my verse video on the subject, I included this pork chop plot showing that it was possible to intercept this object and do a flyby with a spacecraft, but you had to have launched it a year before it was discovered to have any chance of getting there with you know, the kind of Delta V available to us. This, by the way, was created using a tool created by the Asteroid Institute. They hadn't officially launched this tool at that point, but it was good that it was there because the JPL pork chop plot wasn't able to actually go into the past and do these calculations. If you have big plans for small bodies, the Asteroid Institute might have some tools to help you out. Anyway, a few weeks later, some actual scientists did actual work studying the, the problem in a little more detail. And, you know, they used... I don't know, I, I kind of read their paper and it sounded like they were doing something very similar to pork chop plots, but uh, regardless, they came to exactly the same conclusion as me, that you needed either ridiculous amounts of velocity or a time machine to be able to reach it from Earth, but they also looked at intercepting this comet from Mars, and Mars it was much more doable, only needing about 5 kilometers per second. 
And it turns out there are a lot of spacecraft already around Mars. If only they had any propulsion capability left that would allow them to leave Martian orbit and go out chasing down a comet, we would have an opportunity for some amazing science. But then, uh, remember Avi Loeb? Uh, well, he had a great idea. He said, how about Jupiter? Comet Atlas is going to come within about one third of an AU of Jupiter. And there is actually a spacecraft orbiting Jupiter, which has some propulsion capability left over. The Juno spacecraft has been studied, Jup studying Jupiter since it arrived there in 2016. And it was originally supposed to lower its orbit down closer to uh, Jupiter to allow it to make more observations in the time that it had. But it had a propulsion uh, problem and they decided not to complete this slowdown maneuver, therefore leaving it with potentially some propellant on board. Furthermore, it is in a highly eccentric orbit around Jupiter. The uh, Ap Apojov is pretty much way below Jupiter's orbit and the comet is going to fly past below Jupiter's orbit. And if you've played Kerbal Space Program, you know that it doesn't take much energy if you fire your engines at Perijov to escape the planet and get out into deep space. And if you do a naive back-of-the-envelope calculation, you can figure out that Juno could, in theory, leave Jupiter with enough speed to cross one-third of an AU by the time the comet crosses Jupiter's orbit. The problem is, it would be in the wrong place. And so the paper in question actually does a lot more analysis, looking at uh, how it would have to modify the spacecraft's orbit around Jupiter before making the departure burn. And they come up with a number of about you know 2.7 kilometers per second is what they would need. And really, the, the reason for this is because they end up having to raise the uh, perijove higher and therefore they can't take as much advantage of the Oberth effect as they can right now with uh, Juno flying very low over the poles of the planet. And this possibility did, uh, you know, prompt Representative Anna Polina of Florida to ask NASA whether they should extend the mission to investigate this. Right now, the end of the Juno mission is slated for J September of 2025. Uh, the funding runs out and the White House doesn't want it funded anymore. So they want to, you know, have the spacecraft slam into Jupiter so that, well, on one hand, they'll claim it's for planetary protection. But on the other hand, it's very hard to campaign for funding a mission further if it's dead. And while I would love to send Juno off into deep space, the Delta V budget almost certainly isn't there, never mind that they would need an impulsive burn from that main engine, which they were very concerned about firing again. The problem was that helium check valves that would pressurize the fuel and oxidizer systems were not opening as expected. And if they weren't opening as expected, there was a pretty good chance that the engine was going to be running with a, an oxidizer fuel ratio which was off nominal. That could result in either the engine burning through or potentially oxidizer being pushed into the fuel loop or vice versa, leading to combustion inside the plumbing and therefore again a loss of mission, which is why they decided to just stick in the higher orbit than they had originally planned. But hey, if the mission's going to end, why not just give it a go? Well, they did the math for that and Based on our estimates that it has about 1.3 to 1.4 kilometers per second of delta V available, well, uh, you can see that that would get it to just outside 20 million kilometers, although it would get slightly closer if it could figure this maneuver out in the next 10 days or so. But they've continued to work on it. There's a new revision of the paper that uh, comes up with a new solution for September 15th departure. It gives them more time to do some intermediate maneuvers. And if you have like 1.3 kilometers per second, then uh, yeah, you could get within like 13 million kilometers, which is a lot better. Again, we come to the conclusion that if we had seen this object sooner, we might have had time to put more plans into action. To adjust this orbit, it might have been able to get there in the time available. And I'm sure Vera Rubin will help on that front. It'll also probably find more objects, which means we'll get better statistics, which will probably make this object a lot less like a statistical outlier and therefore a lot less likely to be claimed that it, this is an alien uh, spacecraft of some kind. Another interesting bit of research I wanted to share was uh, this 
plot showing the orbit plotted backwards around the galaxy. So the yellow line is where the you know the the sun orbit, and the red one is where this comet would have been. And you see that it doesn't go that far closer to the center of the galaxy, relatively speaking. Sixty kilometers per second is a big deal when you're flying through the solar system, constrained by a single star. But when you're constrained by an entire galaxy of stars, it suddenly not that big a deal anymore. But when we put the Sun and this comet side by side uh, edge on in the galactic disk, you can see this comet does rise and fall a whole lot hot further, right? And it becomes logical to ask, is this because it formed in a star that was much further out of the galactic plane, or was it just kicked out there via, you know, an encounter with its parent star that kicked it off at very high speed? Both are possible, but if it did form further out of the plane, it could be that this is from an earlier time in the galaxy when star formation occurred much more, you know, higher points throughout the galactic disk, therefore implying that this uh, formed around a star which was forming many, many years before this our sun formed. We all know because this thing came from outside the solar system, it has the potential to be older than the solar system. In fact, the odds are in favor of it being older than the solar system, given that the, the galaxy has been around a lot longer than the sun. But given the limited chances we're going to have to observe this and analyze it, I don't think we're going to get a slam dunk on any, you know, any understanding of how old this object is. But, you know, maybe next time, maybe next time we'll get a better lead time on it and we'll get a better chance to understand the object through a close encounter. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>